Welcome to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, a member of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal, and it's my pleasure to be your host for this program today. Uh, before we get into the program, I'd like to mention that if you have any questions or comments or even suggestions for things you'd like to see in terms of topics and on the Sunday Night Prime program, please send your emails to Sunday Night Prime at EWTN.com. I repeat that, Sunday Night Prime at EWTN.com. Well, you know, throughout the history of the church, the Holy Spirit, who's kind of like the spiritual director of the church, who gives us the, his, gift, his different gifts and uh, moves us in the missions that God has given to each one of us to accomplish. Many times, God raises up great individuals. They become leaders in the Christian community. And oftentimes, through His grace, they accomplish great deeds of charity, uh, evangelization and charity uh, that can help people in various needs and situations. And many times they also become the leaders of new movements. Now we've had throughout the history of the church, we've had great saints, for example, I think St. Francis, and he founded the Franciscan order. God used him for that and gave the church a beautiful spirituality. And on the other hand, we had St. Dominic. God raised him up also. And we have the Dominican order, you know, which has been a great light in the church. And then the Jesuits, you know, great teachers of spirituality and the missions and so on. So God is always stirring up great, need, great uh, movements, great individuals to meet the needs of the church in each age. Well, closer to our own time, God raised up a great individual. His name was Father Michael McGivney. And not only is he known for his own personal holiness, but he founded a wonderful group that's doing great work of charity and evangelization in the church. And they are the Knights of Columbus. So we've titled our program tonight, Father Michael McGivney and the Knights of Columbus. And we're very happy to have a very special member of the Knights of Columbus, Mr. Andrew Walther. Andrew, I want to welcome you to the program. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you. Very good to be here, Father. Okay. Walther is the Vice President of Communications and Media for the Knights of Columbus. Well, you know, you've got a, a great hopeful of a, of a saint there in Father McGivney, don't you? You know, and He's inspiring even today. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's, his life uh, and the things that he accomplished. You know, it's amazing. I see this with, for some years, you know, I'm working with Father, with Bishop Sheen's cause also for canonization. The good that these saintly people do lasts a long time, well beyond their, their leaving this world. Huh? And, uh, and with the Knights of Columbus, we can certainly see so much good that Father McGivney began. I think he left a great legacy in his own life, and Father McGivney also left an ongoing legacy with the many spiritual children that followed him over the course of the past 131 years with the Knights of Columbus as well. Very good, very good. Do you look upon him as a kind of spiritual father? It was interesting you mentioned spiritual I, I think that, that Father McGivney imparted a very distinctive, very active uh, Catholicism to the Knights of Columbus. The idea of really acting out your faith through works of charity, mm -hmm. protecting the family, being focused on the evangelization of the fellow members of your parish. And I think that those hallmarks continue to distinguish themselves today in the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, I, I know certainly uh, when I think of the Knights, I think of the many wonderful works that they are supporting in so many ways, carrying out, you know, a great loyalty to the church that you have. You know, uh, Walter, I'm sure people would like to know, where, where are you from? Where did you uh, grow up? Uh, I'm originally from Los Angeles. I've been uh, on the East Coast at the Knights of Columbus headquarters in Connecticut, where Father McGivney started the Knights of Columbus, mm -hmm. as it happens, uh, for about eight years now. Okay. And uh, lived out in the East Coast once before, so it, it wasn't uh, too much of a transition. and. It's with 14,000 councils all over the world, there's a, there's a lot of traveling and visiting people and seeing the good work that happens all over the country and even all over the world. So um, I'm based in New Haven, but I'm not always there. Uh -huh. Wonderful. Yeah, you're, that's amazing to realize, 14, did you say 14? 14, 14,000 councils. councils. You know, just last night we had celebrated um, the, it was one of our friars who was ordained a priest 
And uh, we had his reception at one of the Knights of Columbus Council Halls. So it was wonderful, a beautiful celebration. They really went all out to make it a wonderful time. So uh, even in that way, we're <laughs> supporting wonderful work there. Um, but you know, let, we've got a lot to talk about, uh, Andrew. And uh, you know, um, your your own work then is uh, working with media and communications. But I, I know that uh, people would like to know how did the Knights get started? How did Father McGinley and why did he get into it? Maybe you can just sure. share with that. Well, 19th century Connecticut was a complicated place. The Catholic Church wasn't well liked. It was a good deal into the 19th century that Catholics could finally do things like hold public office that we take for granted today. And against this sort of backdrop of hostility, a, a very poor church, a very indebted church, a church where the average priest was only living into his late 30s, mm. Father McGivney chooses to be a priest and starts working with the people in the very Industrial Revolution era Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Of course, he himself, as a as a child, had worked in a brass factory and and had a re really knew firsthand what his parishioners were going through. But he had several experiences as a parish priest at St. Mary's in New Haven that drove the point home to him about what was happening to the men of his parish. He saw, for example, that it was very difficult for them to live out their Catholic faith together. That there were lots of draws on their attention or their focus in other directions. Um, maybe as an advancement socially or as a way to get a job. Different groups that weren't Catholic or didn't have a Catholic identity could, could have a, a draw on a, on a man trying to provide for his family. Get ahead, yeah. Uh -huh. In addition, he saw a number of men die in the all too common factory accidents and, and other accidents of the day. And he personally had taken on the role of guardian of a couple of children whose fathers had been killed. And what would happen at that time was that the, the children would sort of be scattered to the four winds. They might end up with relatives. They might end up in um, a state-run orphanage. But there, there was no real good solution. There was nothing to really help hold these families together. And as a result, a lot of mothers lost their children mm -hmm. to the legal process. Yeah. He wanted to keep the family together. He, he saw how important the family was as a societal building block. He saw how important it was to keep Catholic families unified. And so this combination of wanting to strengthen men in their faith, wanting to give them the opportunity to live out their faith through acts of charity, and wanting to protect the viability of Catholic families led him in 1882 to found the Knights of Columbus. And it, it's an interesting year, really, to found the Knights of Columbus. It's the same year that he was participating in preparing a young man for the gallows in a, in a nationwide publicized case, well, um, a young guy named Chip Smith, who had, in a, in a fit of inebriation, killed a police officer, um, apparently without much forethought. But nevertheless, he was sentenced to be hanged. And Father McGivney was there almost daily in his jail cell celebrating Mass, accompanied him to the scaffold, and really was, was pouring out his life and his priestly ministry, not only within the confines of the parish, but outside in the jail and in the basement of the parish with the Knights of Columbus and getting them started. And you have a contrast that our Supreme Knight, Carl Anderson, talks about a lot, where it's the same year, 1882, that Nietzsche is writing about how God is dead. Mm -hmm. And here's Father McGivney bringing God into the most unlikely corners, into the prison, into the basement, into the streets of the city with the acts of charity of the Knights of Columbus, really showing people now around the country and around the world through the work that we do and so many others that God is very much alive and, and witnessing to that by the way we love one another. That's right. That's a, boy, that is a powerful thing. And I, I like the way you made that <clears throat> contrast between uh, Nietzsche at that time you know, saying God is dead as if, you know, we don't need him and, and so on. And here is a, a loving priest filled with the charity of Christ. Love one another as I have loved you. Huh? And that even now, Pope Francis keeps calling us to do exactly that, you know. That's wonderful. And so that's how he started. So he had very much families, uh, holding families together, supporting those who were uh, maybe left uh, in need, indigent, and because of of uh, circumstances and especially the orphans, you know. 
That's a great thing. Uh, well, it, obviously, you, you've grown, and uh, where, where are the Knights today? Are, there, are they all over in many places in the world? We're in countries all over the world, really. Um, mm -hmm. From the United States was the first place we were started in 1882. In mm -hmm. 1897, we moved on up to Canada and began there. In 1905, we began in Mexico and in the Philippines, shortly thereafter in Cuba and Panama, and it snowballed to a number of countries in the Caribbean, mm -hmm. North and Latin America, and obviously the Philippines. And also in, most recently, in 2005, we got started in Poland, so. Oh, that's wonderful, well, the order of the Knights is spreading, huh? You're Absolutely. Knights of Christ, huh? You would say Francis loved that, that idea, that image of the, being a Knight of Christ. So um, it's interesting that he, did he choose that name himself, Knights of Christ? It, uh, Columbus, it, Knights of Columbus? Well, it, it's funny, the, it, when they were having this discussion about what to call the organization, and with the anti-Catholic bias the way it was in 19th century Connecticut, Father McGivney suggested to the men that they call themselves Sons of Columbus. And they, they kicked that around for a while. A lot of these guys were Civil War veterans. And one of them said, you know, I think it should be Knights of Columbus. And the name stuck, and it's been Knights of Columbus ever since. But the mm -hmm. idea was to show the American public at the time that had a, a real problem believing that Catholics could also be good citizens, that from the beginning of the discovery of the New World, that it was, it was a Catholic. And, and Columbus was the person in the 19th century that was the Catholic American hero. Mm -hmm. So the, the history books had a, pro, a single prominent Catholic that they talked about, and his name was Columbus. So it made perfect sense to peg the organization to Columbus as an example of someone who was both seen in a patriotic way and in a Catholic way. Very good. Well, yeah, certainly um, Columbus, you know, bringing Christ here and that uh, the discovery of America, um, putting, you know, claiming, uh, what was it, uh, the country, uh, not Haiti, but uh, uh, the, um, where El Sa no, not Sa was it San, San Salvador, Salvador, San Salvador. The Dominican Republic. Uh, Dominican yeah. Republic, that's it, that name was slipping my mind. Uh, yeah. And uh, when he claimed that there for Christ, huh? yes, El the Savior. Well, you know, now today you number about uh, close to two million, don't you? Two yeah, million members. we're more than 1.8 million all over the world, the bulk in the U.S., Canada, and the Philippines, as well as in all of the other countries we mentioned, but mm -hmm. definitely a growing organization, an organization that to this day seeks to live out those ideals that Father McGivney set, charity, unity, and fraternity. Yeah, that's your three, three part philosophy. Charity, unity, and fraternity, and very quickly they added patriotism. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's talk a little bit, we have a few more minutes for this segment, uh, Andrew. Let's talk a little bit about the, the charity. I know that uh, that was a, very uh, big, big part of the work, you know, uh, we hear, uh, you know, that um, with your councils working to reach out to the people. Well, Father McGivney uh, founded the Knights of Columbus with the first principle as charity. Charity was the, the first principle, the key, really, to the Knights of Columbus. And when you, when you look at what this means globally, in our last fraternal year, we had more than $158 million and more than 70 million hours of service donated to charitable causes. It means that in everything from small towns to big cities to natural disasters and crises, you'll find the Knights of Columbus responding in some way, whether it's within a parish, specific needs that a parish has, mm -hmm. specific needs that a community has, um, any number of programs designed really to fit the needs of that community. And there are some sort of uh, top level na nationwide programs, international programs that we run as well that meet the needs in a number of places. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, you've been working, I know, uh, in so many ways with, uh, I know, uh, it was looking over some of the things you're talking about, the doing uh, work here locally and, you know, the local uh, charities, the blood drives, the uh, helping with that, and uh, also, too, the, um, was it food for families? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, people don't know some of the firsts that the Knights of Columbus were involved with, but one of our firsts was being the first national organization to work with the Red Cross on a nationwide blood drive. And mm -hmm. so we've been doing that ever since. Food for families, we do food collection during Lent in some places, other times of the year in other places, mm -hmm. to really help those in need to eat. And it's, it's all in the spirit of Father McGivney. Right, and that's the 
the works of mercy is in hand. I was hungry, and you fed me. Well, Angel, we're going to have to take a little break now. Don't go away. We've got a very interesting program. Huh? We've got a lot to share with you. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, uh, your host for tonight's program, and our special guest is Andrew Walther, who is the Vice President of Communications and Media for the Knights of Columbus. And uh, you've been sharing some marvelous things with us, and I'm sure this, uh, this segment, too, we're going to hear an awful lot more, too, about the wonderful works that uh, Father McGivney began and, uh, and through the founding of the Knights of Columbus. We were talking about some of the local things or things doing in, in our country um, nationally. Were there any other ones that you might want to add? Uh, into well, I break? think one of our very popular programs that's really been embraced by councils all over this country, especially in the, the northern half of the country, is Coats for Kids. We provide new coats to thousands of children each year who otherwise wouldn't have a warm coat during the winter. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible when you when you see these the, the looks on the, the faces of these children who've received a brand new coat, who are able to go to school and stay warm. And and it's just it's just a wonderful thing that, that helps keep them going, that just makes their entire day. And it's it's a it's a great thing. A lot of our councils also do feeding programs, not just raising food for food banks, but I, I was with uh, our Supreme Knight Carl Anderson up in uh, Chicopee, Massachusetts on Thanksgiving. And they serve dinner to thousands of people, no questions yeah. asked. It's a full restaurant experience at their hall. They have tables, they have, they're have they serving the people on, on real plates and real glasses with, with waiters and waitresses coming and bringing them their food and taking hundreds of meals out to the homebound as well. R really meeting the needs of that community. And again, I mean, anybody can show up. If they're lonely, if they're poor, if they just want people to be around, everybody's welcome. Well, that is uh, the works of mercy. Uh, I keep thinking of them, you know, Jesus saying, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked, you clothed me. And all the wonderful things that, uh, which, you know, we, we don't uh, realize sometimes how much people are suffering, especially as the economy uh, seems to falter and uh, people may be out of jobs. Uh, they can't always make ends meet. And, uh, you know, they need a hand. And it's tough for people to have to ask for it, you know, to feel like a kind of shame at times. But, you know, the Knights are there to provide it. You know, people don't don't feel uh, as embarrassed to come and just accept what somebody's giving them something that they really need. You know, so that's really great. And I know you're not only working on the national level but the international, aren't you? Somebody Absolutely. Here, yeah. And we have programs all over the world. We've, uh, you know, after natural disasters in the Philippines or Mexico, you'll find our guys there helping with the relief activities that go on um, from coast to coast in this country. Certainly in Canada where there is a need, the Knights of Columbus respond in, in great numbers. And we're always very, very happy to see these sorts of things happen all over the world because it, it gets back to the founding mission. It gets back to charity and to this unity with the church where we're, we're helping each other, we're helping those people that most are in need. And we're, we're not, uh, we're not for, trying not to forget anyone, making sure that, that uh, we do whatever we can to help all of God's children including especially those on the margins. Yeah, and not only is it the, the poor and the needy that you're reaching out to, but the people, the Knights themselves, are growing in that charity of doing that hands-on work directly with those in need. You know, I, I know because in our community, we have a few, uh, uh, you know, shelters that we run and uh, food giveaways and our sisters, uh, you know, soup kitchen and so on like that, uh, where there are those people who, who are uh, very much in need and, you know, to uh, provide, you know, generously. And uh, so it's a wonderful work, wonderful work that you're, you're doing in so many places, too. I know uh, we were talking a little bit before the show, we mentioned about the military. I, um, 
I didn't know, uh, you know, that the Knights were really active with the military. That, that sounds very interesting. Before there was a USO, there were Knights of Columbus, what they called back then army huts. And this started in, I believe, 1916 with General Pershing in the Mexican campaign. Mm -hmm. And they were relaxation centers for the troops so that they could come off of the front line, write a letter home, get something to eat, uh, read a magazine, maybe play baseball or something with the other guys. When World War I started, the program really took off. We had hundreds of centers in Europe. Um, as well as centers in the United States behind the line. We were written up in the African American history of World War I as being notable because we were the only organization that ran a program like this that didn't draw the color line. Mm -hmm. It was an organization that, that really embraced the needs of these troops. I mean, coming off the horrors of the front line in World War yeah, I, yeah. coming back and being able to have a place of calm, to be able to write back to your parents or your loved ones, we provided chaplains to the military and, and truly all over Europe from, from England to Germany after the war to France to Vladivostok, Siberia. We were, we were there with the troops and really a feature of that war was the service we provided. We were commended by General Pershing who was the commander of the American forces in Europe. Mm -hmm. And all of, all of that ended up in the Second World War becoming the USO. So now we have the USO, which is the United Service Organizations, which provide for the troops in, in a similar way. Are you working and with them too? They, the, yeah. When they were first started, a, the, the Catholic Church had a place at the table, and representing the church, among others, was our Supreme Knight at the time, Francis, uh, Francis Matthews, I'm sorry. Oh, the so of the time, Francis yeah. Matthews was the Supreme Knight at the time. He later went on to be Secretary of the Navy, but he was, he was uh, representing mm -hmm. the bishops at that point during the war. Our work with the military has continued. We've done a lot of work more recently with the Archdiocese for Military Services USA. Mm -hmm. In fact, yes. I just got back from uh, uh, Lourdes, France, where they had the International Military Pilgrimage, and we were helping to sponsor the American troops who were there, many of them wounded, mm -hmm. many of them mm -hmm. uh, retired, many of them active duty coming together with military people from all over the world to pray at Lourdes in this, this great demonstration of men of faith, men protecting their country, but also profoundly men of peace. And mm -hmm. that work for the evangelization of the military has continued going all the way back to World War I and before. It's something that the Knights of Columbus has done with prayer books that we've provided for the military. Yes. We've provided hundreds of thousands of these um, to support for the facilities and, and the use of the Archdiocese for Military Services, to so Knights of Columbus councils and roundtables on military bases. Mm -hmm. We just had a blood drive at Ramstein Air Base in Germany that was written mm -hmm. up on the Army website this week. Oh, wow. um, we've had roundtables in Afghanistan and Iraq that have done an enormous amount of charitable work for the people in those areas. Mm -hmm. So you have this incredible force for charity even on the front lines of today's military. That's, uh, that's really, really encouraging because um, I, I don't think people realize how, uh, how difficult it can be, uh, not only from physical danger in the military, but also isolated from their families. When you're lonely, uh, you know, you're out there, and uh, especially with tours of duties, uh, many of them uh, might come in a period of, the, you know, of a soldier's uh, time in, in service. Um, they really do need every kind of support, the physical and the spiritual. I know when you mentioned the prayer books, I know working with the Archbishop Sheen Foundation, we were sending the little prayer book he wrote. He wrote a book, it was entitled uh, the, wartime, the Wartime Prayer Book, and uh, um, we were sending copies to the, uh, the soldiers, and one chaplain actually wrote back. He said, uh, you're not making my work easier, he said. You're making it possible because to support what the chaplains were doing. They were giving, of course, the sacraments, preaching, but the soldiers needed prayer. They need our prayers, they need our prayer books that we can send them. So thank you for what you're doing for our men. You know, they're risking their lives for the defense of our nation. We have a freedom uh, and hope we maintain it always. Um, and they've given, many have given their lives over the years. And it's so great to know that the Knights are there, keeping them, giving them courage, giving them, showing them that people do care. 
appreciate the sacrifices that they're making. Um, I know you also had mentioned too, uh, Andrew, about disaster relief. Um, it seems like you were involved in what the attack 9-11 and... Well, right after the attack on 9-11, our Supreme Knight Carl Anderson called together a bunch of the officers of the Knights of Columbus. And, and with this group of officers, they, they talked about uh, what needed to happen in terms of a response. And, and what the Supreme Knight came up with was that we should go out to the people who had lost loved ones in the attack, mm -hmm. especially the first responders, the, the families. Yes. And so we provided some of the first money, emergency relief money, to get into the hands of, of these people who had victims of, of the terrorist attack. And that money w was to just hold them over until whatever else came in, came in, but to, to keep them going, to pay their rent, to pay their utilities, and so on. Mm -hmm. And that's always been a, a, an important aspect of what the Knights of Columbus has done in terms of really helping people to get through difficult times. Going back to the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and fire, we provided an enormous amount of, of money to help the city rebuild way mm -hmm. back then. And, and so this is, if there, as there have been really um, enormous needs, the Knights of Columbus has, has stepped up and 9-11 was certainly one of those instances post 9-11 um, more recently with West Texas, with yes, the huge explosion right? there. You yeah. have a town of about 2,000 people and 500 members of the Knights of Columbus in that town. Wow. So we were very well positioned to help people get on with their lives, to put money into exactly the right hands, to do a great amount of good, and the public was very generous in supporting that work. Also with the huge tornado we had just a couple of weeks ago, in Oklahoma, the same thing. The Knights of Columbus were able to mobilize more than 100 volunteers very quickly, were able to raise a great deal of money for the relief of the people who had lost houses to this tornado that I understand yeah. was almost a mile wide. I mean, it was really, it was really uh, an incredible, but, but very focused. The, uh, the benefit is having so many local councils and then having had some of these experiences in the past and having some expertise at the state and national level, we're really able to coordinate with our guys on the ground to do an enormous amount of good, say after a Hurricane Katrina, after a Sandy, yes. after any of these things. We can, we can come in with a combination of expertise and, and boots on the ground and really help people start solving their problems. Yeah, it's really the spirit of Father McGivney staying alive, isn't it? He was helping those people back then and, and the Knights are still doing it. That's wonderful work. And, I hope that uh, you know our people pray for you and try to support whatever way they can. I know, I know. Uh, as we were talking a little bit before the program, Andrew, we say, said that the the knights. Uh, one of the reasons why uh, you know the doing these works, they're hoping to get others to join them in carrying out these works, but to also to inspire other people, like Father McGinley was inspired when he saw the need. I think that's a great thing. You know, when you see the need and. You know, the inspiration comes from the Lord. I can do something. And we can't take away all the problems in the world. Only God can do that. But we can do what we can, you know. Uh, I always like the story of Mother Teresa of Calcutta. And this lady said to her, uh, Mother, I wish I could do what you do. She did such great things as a saintly woman of our time. And um, she said, I wish I could do what you do. And the Mother Teresa, with her great wisdom, said, said, look, you do what I can't do. I'll do what you can do, but together we'll do something beautiful for God. So, so the Knights are inspiring people to do what they can do, and the Knights are doing what they can. And that's the idea. As, as new men join the Knights of Columbus, the idea is to really activate them in charity, help them grow in their faith by living out their faith, mm -hmm. and really being a force for good in the parish, in the community, and society at large. Mm -hmm. That's that's the real goal of the Knights of Columbus. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and I know you've done some work there in Rome. It, it, uh, it said here, the, the charity in Rome. Absolutely. I mean, going, going back to 1920, in 1918, we had one of these army huts in Rome, in mm -hmm. the Minerva Hotel at the time. And despite the anti-American sentiment, after the Treaty of Versailles, Italy didn't get as much land as it wanted, they allowed the American flag to fly in one place in Rome and that was on our army hut. The embassy had to take it down, but the army hut remained. Well, People loved it. And Pope Benedict the XV, yes. seeing what we had done in Rome, asked us to come back on a more permanent basis 
and do something for the children of Rome. So we established a whole series of playgrounds, and if people have ever been to Rome, there are not a lot of public parks in Rome, not a lot mm -hmm. of places for kids to play. Yeah. So we established these playgrounds. We also did some catechesis on some of these, and, and it was something that even through World War II, even during the dark days of, of the fascist government in Italy, we were able to continue doing charitable work and even helping to feed people in Rome from our playgrounds and organizing from some of our playgrounds yes. behind the scenes. It's just amazing. People knew nothing. I, I knew nothing of this was going on. So it's great to, to hear all about this. Well, listen, we're going to have to take a break right now, but don't go away. We've got a lot more to share with you. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Sunday Night Prime. I'm Father Andrew Apostoli, your host for today's program, which is entitled Father Michael McGivney and the Knights of Columbus. And our very special guest is uh, Andrew Walther, who is the Vice President for Communication and Media uh, for the Knights of Columbus. And uh, Andrew, you've been informing us about a lot of wonderful things that the Knights are doing. Uh, I know we talked about the charity, but you had said another one of the key legs or parts of the uh, program of, that the Knights do is evangelization. And I know, I remember as a young boy, some of the literature that the Knights had put out was very helpful to me. Well, going back to Father McGivney, he founded the Knights, obviously, to protect Catholic families, to engage in acts of charity, and to support the faith of the men who joined, both in terms of actively living out their faith through charity, but also in terms of giving them this network that supported their faith together. Mm -hmm. And over the years, the Knights of Columbus has published a series of pamphlets called Catholic Information Service. Mm -hmm. Through the Catholic Information Service, we've published pamphlets on all sorts of uh, topics of church teaching, morality, et cetera, et cetera. The, the most recent um, series of the Catholic Information Service is on the new evangelization. Yes. And we have a wonderful director in Washington, D.C., Michelle Boris, who's overseeing this, uh, this series and mm -hmm. really bringing that whole concept of the new evangelization to light for people who are interested. You know, I think, uh, Andrew, I think I received copies of a, a few of them anyway, like sample copies to get, get interest, stir interest. Uh, how can our people, uh, if they would uh, like to get that information, is there a way for them that they uh, contact the information? Sure, people can go to kofc.org, our website, and they can uh, order the various pamphlets there. Mm -hmm. They can, you know, if their pastor's interested, certainly they can be sent to churches for literature racks, they can be sent to individuals. And the idea is really, when you, when you go back to Father McGivney, he was getting lay people involved in the 1880s. This is long before, say, John Paul wrote Ecclesia in America, yes. long before the Second Vatican Council. He was very far ahead of his time in terms of understanding what a force the laity could be for good within the community and, and for this network that would evangelize each other mm -hmm. and support each other in their faith. So I think that as we go on today, people can actually pick up these booklets, read about the new evangelization, understand what this word that they hear often sometimes very well explained. Other times, maybe people are wondering, what's the new evangelization? Well, this is the perfect opportunity to find out. If you go to kofc.org, you click on Catholic Information Service, you can order the booklets and, and really get a deeper understanding of how not only to live out your faith, but how to make your life a witness mm -hmm. to the faith for others. And they become evangelizers in that way. Huh? We need that. Huh? Pope uh, Benedict was calling us to that in a very special way with the year of faith and uh, promoting the new evangelization and encouraging us. Now Pope Francis is telling us, get out there with the people, share that faith. So You know, he said in his address to the Diplomatic Corps a couple of months ago, Pope Francis said that going back to St. Francis and even before, the church has had this, this real important emphasis on orphans, on the marginalized, on the poor, on the people who really need our help. And he said that there's another kind of poverty in the Western world, and it's very similar to something Mother Teresa used to say. He said in the Western world, the poverty 
is a spiritual poverty. And he referenced what Pope Benedict once called a dictatorship of relativism. And mm -hmm. that need to witness to our faith, especially in more industrialized countries is very important. Sometimes maybe somebody lives in a community where there isn't as much poverty. Well, the witness of the faith, I think, people need to remember that the same love that impels us to help the poor is the love that helps us to witness to our faith, to say what we say on moral issues, to say what we say on the church teaching. It's, it's love for the other person. If we didn't care, we wouldn't do anything, we wouldn't speak up. That's right. To, to not be ashamed to say, well, this is what I believe. Uh, I don't think everybody in the world is going to agree with me, but uh, they didn't all agree with Jesus either. So, uh, but this is what I believe, and to have that courage. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, it's often been said, uh, at least the people I've been speaking with, that it seems we need to re-educate our people in the basics of their faith. And that's exactly what, as a, the uh, this series, I know as I read a couple of them, um, reminded me, as I said, when I was a young boy, I remember reading those nice pamphlets that the Knights had put out, all about different things on the church, you know, about the Pope, the bishops, the sacraments, and, you know, and so many of our teachings. And, you know, the original evangelization was bringing Christ to people who didn't know him at all. The new evangelization is about bringing Christ, often through our witness, you know, St. Francis said, uh, preach and if necessary, use words. words yes, right. Um, bringing him through our witness to people that have heard of him but have either forgotten or haven't learned enough or have turned away. Yeah. And so that's, that's the whole thrust of the new evangelization is bringing mm -hmm. people that once had this back into the fold. Yeah, that's so necessary. And, and you know, I think many families, uh, most families that I know, as someone in there has drifted away. Uh, the Lord is the good shepherd. He goes and looks for his straying sheep. You know, we have to pray for them. That's why my devotion to Our Lady of Fatima, that's really what she's been asking for his prayers and sacrifices to bring those who have uh, left the Lord to come back, you know. But uh, we need to know what we believe and to be, to be firm and solid in that and faithful to that teaching. The truth is, um, uh, I remember the story of uh, Pope uh, John Paul. A reporter asked him one time, your Holiness, if you could give just one quote from Scripture to the Catholic people, what quote would you give them? He thought the the, the, the uh, uh, newspaper, the, the news person thought the Pope would have to think about it, Old Testament, New Testament. Without hesitation, he said, tell the people the truth will set you free. Free from the confusion, free from the self-centeredness and so on, you know. So uh, the Knights are really providing uh, a great source of that truth. Uh, like you said, you quoted the, the tyranny of relativism. If it's, it's all up to me, it's what I want, and you know, people today say the truth is what I want it to be. No, we have to answer to God who created the truth and who said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So it's a great work you're doing, and I hope that our people will take advantage. You know, be evangelist. This is a great opportunity, isn't it? Cont it, it, it is, and and you know that's the that's the important thing also with the charity. When we're out there helping people with the Special Olympics, building houses with some group like Habitat for Humanity, putting coats on kids, feeding the hungry, all of that says we're doing this because we love God and our fellow neighbor. That's mm -hmm. that's what motivates us to do this, and that really is a witness. That is evangelize uh, evangelism. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. that is evangelization, that is evangelizing our culture. And we've heard the term, a charity that evangelizes, something that John Paul used in Ecclesia in Europa. And that's what this is. It's a charity that evangelizes. This was the witness of the early Christians, the way they loved one another. And mm -hmm. this needs to be our witness today. Yeah, that's the, uh, Bishop Sheen used to say, that's the one argument the world will still accept from us is that we are authentic to what we say we are, you know, and it's so important. And it's so important for the people to, again, be reminded of these things, to re relearn their faith. And uh, so we have to pray for the great work of the promotion of evangelization that the Knights are doing. And uh, it's just great. Well, uh, you know, we want to move on to, I know um, a few other things, I know the, the, the Knights. Uh, you also, maybe we should, before we move on to 
Father <laughs> Michael McGivney, we've got to say something about him and how his cause is doing, his life. But you had also shared, uh, Andrew, about CatholicPulse.com. Sure. Yeah, maybe a little bit, so people might know about it. Well, people know about the Knights of Columbus, various publications. We talked about Catholic Information Service. There's also Columbia Magazine, mm -hmm. which yeah. reaches all of our members, yeah. all 1.8 million uh, members. Get I like Columbia the Magazine. I like the present cover with Pope Francis on it. Yes, <laughs> no, it's it's wonderful. And we also have CatholicPulse.com, which is a Catholic news website that has the top stories in church news, national news, and international news every day, as well as original content from various commentators and columnists, mm -hmm. giving the Catholic perspective on the news around the world. That's very important. You know, we need uh, we need to to help our people sift through so much of what they hear in the, the public media, oftentimes we get different kinds of stories. And, sure. You know, uh, so someone who can really tell us this is exactly what's going on and this is exactly what we need to keep in mind to make the right choices, uh, to be able to inform other people, you know. And this is something the Knights of Columbus have done in terms of public awareness going way back. When you go back to the 1920s, the Knights of Columbus actually commissioned W.E.B. Du Bois to write a book called The Gift of Black Folk to set the historical record straight on the contributions of African Americans to the United States. Now this is 40 years before the Civil Rights Campaign. Mm. So it, it was really a, a huge, the Civil Rights Movement doesn't come until four decades later and the Knights of Columbus are, are doing this. When the Mexican Catholics were persecuted by Plutarco Elias Callas, it was the Knights of Columbus who took up that cause as well in Columbia Magazine, in pamphlets that were printed, working with other uh, Catholic news outlets and, and priests and so on to really bring pressure on the American government to stop the persecution of Catholics south of the border. Mm -hmm. And these, these were ways in which the Knights of Columbus was certainly being charitable to the people that were in need, but also making sure that Catholics were aware of what was going on and were, were really well informed about the threats to their fellow Catholics or in some cases as when the Ku Klux Klan attempted to ban Catholic education in the state of Oregon and the Knights of Columbus helped fund the case all the way to the Supreme Court that one of the cases that really codified the idea that, that private Catholic religious education is, is constitutionally guaranteed in this country. The Knights of Columbus were, were behind that and it was because people need to know and people need to have these rights and, and to embrace their faith and their ability to live out their faith, not just within their church, but in their community. And that really is the genius of Father McGivney. He didn't keep the faith in the four walls of the church. He brought the faith into the public square with Chip Smith and his ministry to him before he died, and also with the Knights of Columbus who went out into the streets to do the kinds of charitable work that were needed. Yes, yeah, it's so important. Yeah, because we are, uh, Jesus said, you're the light of the world. I mean, you're the salt of the earth, and he said, if the salt loses its its tang, I always remember the translation. You know, you, one translation was, if it loses its tang, it's useless. You got to throw it out. It's, it's no good. It can't flavor anything. It uh, salt brings out nice, nice f f flavor of the food, and at the same time, uh, you, you know, it preserves. You know, so that's what we have to do: make the faith so appreciable. Well, you know, that brings us now to to Father McGivney himself, doesn't it? You know. What a remarkable person. And now his cause, his cause is moving along. I, I know, um, of course, I've worked with the cause of Bishop Sheen in, in, in helping to uh, provide some, you know, um, uh, you know uh, assistance to getting it started. And now I always remember there were two things that they always said, before we can open the cause, you have to show that, first of all, the individual who you consider for canonization has to enjoy a reputation of holiness. And the second time, second second thing that they, they have to be able to show that people have prayed to that individual and have felt that they've been receiving favors. Now it doesn't have to be a spectacular miracle, but the favors are coming. You know, was that true uh, it, as far as you know, uh, Andrew, in the case of uh, Father McGivney? Oh, absolutely. In fact, we have a website, uh, FatherMcGivney.org, and people mm -hmm. can go to that website. They can leave favors received. They oh. can read the favors received by other people. But even going back to Father McGivney's lifetime, one of his contemporary priests wrote about how when Father McGivney would go into the community, people saw him as saintly. Chip Smith, oh. the man who was hanged, who Father McGivney brought back into the church, 
talked about Father McGivney's saintly witness to him and getting him to overcome his fear of death, to embrace his fate and to reconcile himself completely to God and the church. So from the very beginning, people understood that Father McGivney was a very saintly man. And that has continued to uh, right up until now, where you can go on the website, you can see the favors that people are receiving. You can see the number of people Mm -hmm. that pray for the canonization of Father McGivney. And uh, there, you know, his cause is in Rome, and you know a thing yes. or two about causes. Yeah. It's in Rome under consideration at the Vatican. Mm-hmm. And all of the pieces that go into that, um, in, including uh, reports of miracles and so on, and, and mm-hmm. uh, it, one particular possible miracle, mm-hmm. uh, go, go into that process. Yes. And so we pray often and regularly for, for the beatification and canonization of Father McGivney. And mm-hmm. I think uh, that is something that many of our members look forward to with, uh, with great joy. Yes, well, I, we hope and pray, yes, what it means to have a canonized saint, you know. Uh, now, he's already venerable, isn't he? He is. He's a venerable servant of God. Yes. And... Uh, you know, it's not it's not every organization that can say they were they were founded by someone who's a venerable servant of God. And mm-hmm. of course, we talked about the Knights being founded by Father McGivney to help in the community, to help in the parish, to give this real role of witnessing to the laity, mm-hmm. and to protect Catholic families financially, to to help the people on the margins of society. Now, in 1882, this was widows and orphans, and it was a pass the hat. Somebody died, they would more or less pass the hat take up a collection for the family to keep the family together. Together, yeah. Over time, that grew into a very large Catholic insurance operation that mm-hmm. continues to help protect our members and their families today. So it's, mm-hmm. not, it's not every insurance organization that, says, that can say that they were founded by a venerable servant of God either. <laughs> yeah, but I think right. his business model was excellent mm-hmm. and, yeah. and very ethically oriented, and that mm-hmm. has continued to protect mm-hmm. these, these Catholic families over mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And of course, you know, too, uh, Andrew, just to explain to the people, too, that uh, venerable, being declared venerable, because Bishop Sheen was recently also declared venerable, that means that the Congregation for the Saints, Causes of Saints, has investigated the virtues, the life of the individual, man or woman, whoever it is, and have declared that they lived a life of heroic virtue and that their life can be held up as a model to follow. So that means the church has already given a kind of official recognition to Father McGivney's life of virtue. That's just a great step. I, I think it's wonderful because he, there was so much in his life that continues to play out today in other ways. I mean, having this care for the people on the margins of society, now we see it with Pope Francis, we see the same thing. We see it in Pope Benedict's encyclicals. We see it in so much of what Pope John Paul said, so much of what the Vatican Council wrote. Yes. We see over and over again these themes of Father McGivney in our own day. And sure, the people on the margins have changed. So in Father McGivney's day, it was widows and orphans, and, and sometimes they're still on the margins. Sure. Mm-hmm. But you now have the elderly, you have the unborn, you have the people with special needs, you have the intellectually disabled. And all of these people in some way are reached out to and are helped by the Knights of Columbus, the unborn, through things like the ultrasound initiative that we have, or our work mm-hmm. with Project yes. Rachel, helping to heal parents who've been through the trauma of an abortion. Yeah. And, and so on, and so the, the Special Olympics work mm-hmm. that we do and the work for people with special needs. Mm-hmm. All, of, all of these things are really consistent with fa- what Father McGivney started. Yeah. He started it for the widows and orphans, but it's the same idea that continues, even if the margins shift. And, and those are such great works, as you say, so needed today. So many families, individuals broken by the, the sufferings of abortion, uh, of, uh, you know, just... Uh, living through uh, so many uh, difficulties in our present society, those who are, uh, you know, unemployed, uh, those who are, you know, whose lives are broken by drugs and alcohol, and pornography and all of that, you know. But uh, thank God that, you know, that the Knights are carrying out this great, great, really, crusade. There's Knights, right now they fought crusades. So this is a crusade for Christ. And, um, you know, what was they, just to, to repeat for the, the people, the, uh, Andrew, the website that they could go to, you said? Um, it's fathermcgivney.org. Can they get information about, you have holy cards for prayers? Yes, for we Father? have uh, prayers for his canonization or beatification. We have, uh, you know, his, his uh, bits of his, his history, his life, 
okay. biography. They can also buy his biography, which was done by presidential historian Douglas Brinkley. Oh, okay. It's called Parish Priest, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a New York Times bestseller, and it's a great, a great intro to the life of Father McGivney. I'm going to have to get one of those myself. That's wonderful because, again, you know, the, the, to have a saint, um, there's nothing, it's, it's one of the greatest graces, you know, you reach the heights of holiness, uh, God raises them up for his own reasons, to be examples, inspirations, and we need that today. We need our heroes, don't we? We uh, do, and I think the Knights of Columbus is particularly blessed with the leadership that we've had over time, and especially now with someone like Supreme Knight Carl Anderson, who many of your viewers know from, yes. from the many times he's been on EWTN, really committed to Father McGivney's vision, really committed to making the Knights of Columbus into an organization that evangelizes, seeing a charity that evangelizes as critical, and really working for the good of the church at home, abroad, anywhere that it's needed. Yeah, well, that's a great thing, and it's a great note. We're going to have to, unfortunately, uh, Andrew, we have come to the end of the program, but uh, I, I, I want to thank you so much for sharing so much about the Knights. I hope people are inspired. Maybe some uh, want to become Knights and become associated with this wonderful organization that God has raised up. Let's pray now, and I'll give you my blessing. Almighty God, we thank you for giving us your servant, your venerable servant, Father Michael McGivney, and for the Knights of Columbus and for all the good they do. May we be inspired by their example and wish to follow that example in our own personal lives. We ask you to bless the Knights, and I want to bless all of you, the viewers now. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God love you. Well, we come to that part in the program now where we do a little appeal for the funds that are needed by EWTN. You know, you witnessed a wonderful program on the Knights of Columbus and uh, Andrew sharing so much of the work and the life of their saintly founder. Now, many of you may have heard this for the first time. And how many people out there, you know, are hearing it for the first time? And how could it reach so many people all over the world um, unless there were an EWTN? You know, uh, the forces of evil, the forces that are trying to change society in the wrong way, they're powerful. They've got great media and everything else. Um, but we have EWTN. You know, Mother herself was inspired to start this station. So please support it with your prayers and any financial contribution. Be as generous as you can. And as Mother said, put your donation between your telephone bill and your electric bill. And uh, God love you for it.